let's start with some advice. Actually, no, I'm not going to show you that. Um, sit all day in a moping posture, sigh, and reply to everything in a dismal voice, and your melancholy lingers. There is no more valuable precept in moral education than this, as all who have experience know. If we wish to conquer undesirable emotional tendencies in ourselves, we must assiduously, and in the first instance, cold-bloodedly, go through the outward motions of those contrary dispositions we prefer to cultivate. Smooth the brow, brighten the eye, contract the dorsal rather than the ventral aspect of the frame, and speak in a major key, cast the genial compliment, and your heart must be frigid indeed if it does not gradually thaw. <laughs> you may recognize the voice of William James speaking through me, um, advising his readers of the journal Mind in 1884. Can you all hear me? Okay, good, good. Um, James's controversial essay, What is an Emotion, has become one of the foundational texts in the modern scientific study of emotions. Earlier in the same essay, James argues that, quote, we feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike, afraid because we tremble. Many 21st century scientists admire James for daring to rethink an accepted series. An event in the world causes a mental, emotional response, which then gives rise to a physiological reaction. No, said James, who studied physiology with Helen von Helmholtz and Heidelberg from 1867 to 1868. The physiological response is the emotion, and any exclusively mental reaction would be, quote, purely cognitive in form, pale, colorless, destitute of emotional warmth. The human mind can't be abstracted from the body, and emotions are bodily phenomena. Today's laboratory scientists who admire James might not agree with his next logical move. If emotions are bodily, and the body can be voluntarily controlled, well, at least to some degree, uh, then one should be able to regulate one's emotions by regulating one's body. If you're feeling dejected or angry, smile, stand up straight, modulate your voice, act as if you were thriving, and you will become happier. And if you don't, there is something wrong with you. <laughs> Um, when we discussed this passage in my Languages of Emotion class last week, uh, my undergraduate student, Sumin Kang, commented on the tone. She said how patronizing she found James's writing, and she wondered how a depressed patient would feel if told, your heart must be frigid indeed if it does not gradually thaw. <laughs> a key word in James's passage is moral. In his view, learning to control one's emotions forms part of one's moral education. In emotions, physiology merges with culture, and no one illustrates the cultural modulation of emotions better than William James, the most famous advocate for their physiological grounding. In this presentation today, I'd like to ask, under what circumstances can emotions, or lack of emotions, be considered pathological? When do emotions become diseases of modern life? A friend of mine who teaches at a religious university, which will remain unnamed, um, told me of her frustration with some of her students' understandings of moral. Her students found the story less moral if it depicted sex out of wedlock, and more moral if it reinforced the biblical lesson. It was as if morality were a fluid that could be quantitatively measured in a container. Um, and I wonder if representations of emotions don't work the same way. When I told people I was going to, uh, what are you talking about afterwards? Let me talk about with whether emotions can be pathological. And then they'd say, oh, you mean whether lack of emotion can be pathological? We're in a cultural moment right now where people are more likely to think of lack of emotion as pathological. But it is this kind of fluid titration model. I can picture myself back in the lab and pouring something out of a graduated cylinder, you know, the right quantity of emotion, you know, rather than what's in that chemical. Um, the linguist Sultan Kuvikshus, um, a Hungarian linguist, has observed that many emotion metaphors work the same way as the fluid in the container. Cross-culturally, languages often figure emotion as a liquid in some kind of vessel. Depending upon environmental conditions, the liquid may heat up, it may leak out, or it might even explode. 
Sigmund Freud made extensive use of these metaphors in three essays on a theory of sexuality and his other works when he talked about channels, stagnancy, and misdirected flow. I don't need to tell anyone at this conference about how representations of health and disease are entangled with those of moral and immoral behavior. We've been hearing a lot about that for the past 48 hours. I would like to show today how representations of emotions form part of this picture. Um, as James indicated, emotions are a moral issue since their expression or suppression affects the well-being of many people besides those who feel them. Experiments by psychologist James Gross, uh, just in the past decade, a respected scholar of emotion regulation, have shown that suppressing emotion not only increases one's own blood pressure, which you might expect, um, it increases the blood pressure of one's conversation partner. Um, as a blend of culture and physiology, emotions are a matter of health, morality, and politics. The observations I'll be making today form part of a larger project I've been carrying out in conjunction with Uta Freibach's group, um, The History of Emotions, um, at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. I've been grateful for the support of Freva and her colleagues as I've investigated metaphors for obnoxious emotions. That's what this project is about. <laughs> okay. The metaphors for socially unloved emotions can be especially revealing of the ways that culture and physiology combine emotional experience. I'm interested in any emotion one is told not to feel, um, any emotion in which one can be said to indulge. Self-pity, prolonged crying, spite, grudges, bitterness, long-term suppressed anger, or personal hate. Sion Nai has explored related emotions, including envy and irritability, in her 2005 book, Ugly Feelings, which is terrific and, and I recommend. Um, she's made the vital point that socially discouraged emotions tend to occur in people with less social power. For the purposes of this project, I'm defining emotion in a traditional and popular way. Um, a neuroscientist such as Paul Ekman would regard these complex interstates I'm talking about as feelings, not emotions, um, because they're not primary, they're not universal, they're <coughs> a culturally inflected mental mess. Uh, I'm calling them emotions rather than affects because I'm interested in the inner experience of individuals whose minds and bodies change with context but who retain a uniqueness that gives their lives meaning. Because we all share a certain enthusiasm for the 19th century here, I'll begin by considering how James's Victorian predecessors thought about emotions, then look closely at one of the most famous representations of unloved emotions, Charles Dickens' portrait of Miss Havisham in Great Expectations. Women abandoned by lovers are notorious, at least in novels and films, uh, for harboring rage, despair, and grudges that can last for decades. Um, in assessments of when emotions become pathological, the gender of the evaluator plays a crucial role. Um, in analyzing Dickens' metaphors for diseased emotions, I want to shed light on the way Victorian understandings of emotional hygiene live on in our current views of emotional regulation and mental health. Metaphors such as let go and move on have a clear bodily grounding, but they also reflect an Anglo-American blend of Judeo-Christian morality and political ideology. Three decades before James proposed his theory of emotions, Herbert Spencer tried to ground the science of mind in biology. Spencer's representation of human feelings in his 1855 Principles of Psychology reflects his effort to create all-embracing knowledge rooted in science. Like James, Spencer stressed the inseparability of feelings from other aspects of mental life. Intellect and feeling cannot be parted, he wrote. No orders of feelings can be completely disentangled from other phenomena of consciousness. The manifest difficulty in disentangling the cognitive from the emotive comes an impossibility. Spencer represented emotions as all penetrating because the biological. Um, at heart, uh, maybe also like James, Spencer was more of a philosopher than a psychologist. Psychiatrist Henry Maudsley ran lunatic asylums and treated patients, and his books on psychology influenced readers beyond the medical community. Maudsley's 1867 book, The Physiology and Pathology of the Mind, backed Spencer's view that body and mind are one. We perceive, 
Hawksley told his readers, how close is the sympathy or connection between the organic system and the emotional or affective life? Once we saw evidence for this physiological grounding of emotions in human behavior, especially the behavior of his female mental patients. When we put ourselves in the attitude that any passion naturally occasions, he observed, it is most certain that we acquire in some degree that passion. So in our emotional life, any particular passion is rendered stronger and more distinct by the existence of those bodily states which it naturally produces. Depending upon how one handled one's body, one could reinforce or diminish strong emotions. Maudsley theorized that an idea was favorable to the impulses or strivings of the individual to self-expansion brings pleasure, whereas an idea which betokens individual restriction, which is opposed to the expansion of the self, brings pain. Like James, Maudsley used creative metaphors, especially spatial ones, to describe emotional experiences and their physiological roots. It sounds just like those two models of opium addiction and withdrawal in the, in the addiction section. I can't remember the name of the speaker, but I'm sure she's here. It was a good talk. Um, Alexander Bain, <clears throat> Scottish philosopher Alexander Bain analyzed the emotions with creative flair. Bain's The Emotions and the Will, um, which came out in 1859, published a year before Great Expectations, shows how creative insight can serve psychology as well as fiction. Bain wrote about the diffusive action of emotions, commenting, the fountains of emotion are more completely stirred by certain kinds of pain than the generality of pleasures. And there's one of those fluid metaphors, the fountains of emotion. Analyzing anger, the irascible emotion, Bain wrote that when another person puts us to pain, we suspend for the time the feelings of compassion, sympathy, and dutiful respect, and leave the field free to other passions. Consequently, he wrote, we withdraw the barriers of a flood always ready to overflow. Bain's characterization of anger as a fluid that's escaped its container emphasizes the social danger of uncontrolled rage. They described emotional pain in terms of a braided skin. As Sian Nai has observed, uh, the term irritation works metaphorically uh, because it describes annoyances as unpleasant tactile sensations. That's what it's itching you, tickling you. In analyzing experiences that can cause anger, they found that, quote, small grinding inflictions are most irritating. A lifetime of minor insults or a vicious blow can cause a painful, festering wound. Like many scientific and literary writers before him, they depicted a psychological wound as a physical one. In his words, quote, some positive application is needed to heal a wound that is of the nature of fretting sore. Bain observes the worst of fronts as painful piercings of the skin. Humiliation leaves a rankling sting behind, he writes, and this sting stirs a desire for revenge. Linguist George Lakoff and Sultan Kubikshis have shown that some metaphors succeed better than others because they bring a rich system of metaphorical entailments. Um, metaphors such as an emotional flood or wound invite a whole host of variations that they really invite creativity and elaboration. If I were to say in the, the, in the creation of emotional experience, physiology flows into culture as the Mississippi flows into New Orleans, the entailments would include levees breaking, neighborhoods collapsing, and alligators swimming around in the water. Uh, the liquid in a container metaphor that Kubikshus has found emphasizes the danger of unregulated emotions. To a man, and they were all men, uh, 19th century psychologists like Bain quoted literary writers to back their claims. Then and now, it would be wrong to envision ideas about emotions as flowing exclusively from science to literature. Literary and scientific writers inspired each other, and in the 19th century, they socialized and shared ideas. Serialized novels appeared in journals alongside articles describing scientific work. In some cases, scientists' use of novels and poems went beyond illustrations to assume the character of evidence. To show that emotions, not intellectual resolutions, move people to act, Henry Maudsley refers to Hamlet. The Shakespearean character, he believes, shows how meditation paralyzes action. 
Uh, Bain quotes Homer when he discusses revenge, which the Greek poet calls sweeter than honey. And in examining motives for revenge, Bain discusses malevolent people who lack sympathy. Instances of this devil-like character are not infrequently to be met with in real life, he writes. And in romance, it often occurs as a creation. The quilt of Dickens is a recent and highly illustrative specimen. To make sure that readers take his meaning, Bain turns to Dickens. Uh, quilt, um, a villain from the old curiosity shop, would have been familiar to most Victorian readers. Psychologists cited novelists who were reading psychologists' work, forming a creative and analytical feedback loop. Dickens' portrait of Miss Havisham has influenced subsequent representations of abandoned women's emotions. Because of the narrative structure Dickens so carefully constructs, readers get to know the vengeful heiress, not from her perspective, but from that of Dickens' male narrative of Pip. Recounted by a middle-aged Pip, Great Expectations describes his abusive boyhood and his emotional growth. Much of Pip's maturing involves his response to financial expectations of which he wrongly believes Miss Havisham is the source. In Pip's narrative, the angry heiress exploits Pip and her war to Stella, whom she's raised to tantalize men. Although Miss Havisham speaks in many scenes, the, rever the reader never sees through her eyes the cruel act that has left her so embittered. In Dickens' evocative depictions of the heiress, he invites the reader to simulate sensations, but they're pip sensations, not those of the miserable old woman. Dickens' choice of perspective affects the reader's judgment. At first, Miss Havisham comes across as physically and morally repulsive. As Pip suffers and gains compassion, readers may sympathize with her despite the harm that she's done in. It's hard to pity Miss Havisham, since she demands pity with such force. Um, she's made her life a monument to a past emotional crime. According to Pip's friend Herbert, Miss Havisham was a spoilt child. Her mother died when she was an infant and her father indulged her. He later married his cook, with whom he had a son, but after that woman's death, Miss Havisham's half-brother grew up riotous. Her father disinherited him, and Miss Havisham's half-brother resented her from then on. In Herbert's account, the half-brother conspired with a showy man who courted her and with whom she fell in love. Her, suitor, her suitor extracted money from her, and Herbert's father, Matthew Pocket, warned her not to marry him, but she was too haughty and too much in love to be advised by anyone. On her wedding morning, she received a letter in which her fiancé heartlessly broke the marriage off. It would be ungentlemanly for Herbert to say so, but his account implies that Miss Havisham deserves her fate. Since Herbert so generously supports Pip, readers have no reason to doubt his word. Herbert tells Pip that since Miss Havisham's aborted marriage, she has never since looked upon the light of day. Alexander Bain's The Emotions and the Will, written the previous year, calls sunlight a universal agent giving enjoyment. In having his jilted character reject the light, Dickens follows a tradition that goes back to Dante Alighieri and probably to human origins. In the fifth circle of Dante's Inferno, sinners damned for anger fight in the muddy river sticks. The poet Virgil, who guides Dante's protagonist, shows that the worst offenders are fully immersed in mud, detectable only through bubbles. It's really sad, they're just like little hermit crabs in the bubbles. <laughs> Unlike the sinners punching and biting each other in the mud, these people repress their anger and live spiteful, lonely lives. Virgil tells the narrator, fixed in the slime, they say, we were sullen in the sweet air that is gladdened by the sun, bearing in our hearts a sluggish smoke. Now we are sullen in the black mire. When Alexander Bain mentions artistic depictions of anger that involve withdrawing oneself into sullen isolation, he seems to have this tradition in mind. In Dante's Hell, sinners experience literally the sins that they committed in life metaphorically, and Miss Havisham creates an anticipatory hell on earth. Pip observes that in her sealed mansion, the daylight was completely excluded, and candles only faintly troubled the darkness. 
The heiress tells Pip dramatically, you are not afraid of a woman who has never seen the sun since you were born? Pip lies and says that he isn't. But, <laughs> but he has reason to fear Miss Havisham. She has summoned him as a sacrificial male for a ritual in which he will undo the emotional crime committed against her. Miss Havisham's decayed mansion serves as a visual metaphor for her emotional mind, filthy due to deliberate neglect. She's created a realm of living death that terrifies the abused boy Pip. As an adult narrator, he struggles to reconstruct his first encounter with the heiress. To convey the world of a woman lost in the past, Dickens emphasizes the odd antics of Pip's memory. Pip recalls two experiences that he had before meeting Miss Havisham. First being taken to see some ghastly waxwork at the fair, <coughs> and second, uh, being taken to see a skeleton in the ashes of a rich dress in a church. Um, then, placing his mind in the moment of his encounter with uh, Miss Havisham, it recalls, now waxwork and skeleton seem to have dark eyes that moved and looked at me. To describe, what Ms. Havisham's, uh, to describe Ms. Havisham's dark world, which he experienced as a child, Pip draws on his adult experiences, which he had after that. I knew nothing then of the discoveries that are occasionally made of bodies buried in ancient times, which fall to powder in the moment of being distinctly seen. She must have looked, have looked as if the admission of the natural light of the day would have struck her the dust. To depict a woman obsessed with the past, Dickens creates passages in which the narrator grapples with the past too. Like Dante, Dickens shapes an environment in which emotion metaphors become literal. Miss Havisham lives in the dark, and she has stopped each clock in her house at 20 minutes to 9, the moment she received her offending letter. Her attempt to halt time's motion corresponds to her arrested emotional state. Humiliated by emotional loss of control, she vows to control each aspect of her life and schemes to control other people's lives, too. She lives surrounded by rot and waste, and she's orchestrated the scene that shocks Pip. She's enabled to decay through perverse, compulsive neglect. On the table that still holds her wedding feast, Pip observes that, quote, an epitome, or centerpiece of some kind, was in the middle of the cloth. It was so heavily overhung with cobwebs that its form was quite indistinguishable. As I looked along the yellow expanse out of which I remember it seeming to grow, like a black fungus, I saw speckled-legged spiders with blotchy bodies running home to it and running out from it, as if some circumstances of the greatest public importance had just transpired in the spider community. <laughs> in Dickens' description, the spider scurrying suggests the natural forces Miss Havisham can't control. She can't stop her feast from rotting or creatures from consuming it or her own body from aging. Despite her efforts to freeze time and emotion, her house is full of movement. The word emotion contains motion and derives from Latin emovere, to move out. Unsurprisingly, metaphors for emotions often involve movements of every kind. Although Miss Havisham stays sealed in her house, she, like her spiders, does move but she moves wrong. Uh, the Western Judeo-Christian tradition in which Charles Dickens and Alexander Vane wrote upholds progressive, linear motion as good and views stasis or circling as suspect. Like light and dark metaphors, these figures of motion have deep-set religious roots. John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress of 1678 depicts an allegorical journey to salvation in which the hero, Christian, falls into the muddy slough of despond. Here, Bunyan writes, Christian wallowed for a time, being grievously bedaubed with dirt. Um, criticism of people wallowing in self-pity um, refers to this religious allegory in which emotion metaphors become literal. Emotionally and morally, Christian has stopped moving forward due to misery, and he can't escape the bog without help. Um, in the story, he's got this pack on his back which corresponds to original sin and somebody named Help has to come up and, and pull him out. This is not a subtle book. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the Western tradition, 
Cyclic motion is often associated with women. The reason is probably biological, but the negative associations with circling, as opposed to progressing linearly, come from culture. If walking forward suggests emotional growth, it won't surprise readers to learn that Miss Havisham has a crutch. Um, she needs a crutch. She can walk, but she prefers her wheelchair, which she tells Pip to push around in circles. The work I had to do, he reports, was to walk Miss Havisham round and round the room, over and over and over again. We would make these journeys. It was like pushing the chair itself back into the past when we began this old slow circuit round the ashes of the bridal feast. Instead of moving forward, Miss Havisham's mind circles an emotional crime scene. In Dickens' depiction, the heiress takes pride and pleasure in her status as emotional victim. Alexander Bain describes angry people in whom, quote, a wound is purposefully kept open in order to enjoy the sweets of vengeance. And Miss Havisham seems to be such a person. In her mind, her status as an injured party brings her power. She lays her hands on her heart, telling Pip it is broken, and he notes she uttered the word with an eager look and with strong emphasis and with a weird smile that had a kind of ghost in it. Miss Havisham's claim, sharper teeth than teeth of mice have gnawed at me, suggests masochism, but the label can't account for her blend of pain and pride. In the novel's climactic scene, as she and Pip realize they've wasted their lives, he reflects on the vanity of her emotion. Quote, I knew not how to comfort her, and shutting out the light of day, she had shut out infinitely more. In seclusion, she had secluded herself from a thousand natural and healing influences. Her mind, brooding solitary, had grown diseased, as all minds do and must and will that reverse the appointed order of their maker. And could I look upon her without compassion, seeing her punishment in the ruin she was, and her profound unfitness for this earth on which she was placed, and the vanity of sorrow which had become a master mania? Ms. Havisham's decades of grief and rage have been vain in two senses. They're purposeless and they're narcissistic. By focusing exclusively on her own pain, she's failed to consider anyone else's. Being rejected made Miss Havisham feel powerless, and to regain her agency, she causes pain to others. Alexander Bain comments on the pleasure of power, this pleasure being invoked as a consolation to the wounded feelings of the agent. He and Dickens really seem to have been on the same page. They're just writing a year apart. Um, Miss Havisham wants revenge, and she tells Pip, when they lay me out dead in my bride's dress on the bride's table, this will be the finished curse upon him. She wants her exploitive fiancé to suffer, but his suffering is not enough. Emotionally, she seeks to undo a crime by reproducing and inverting it. In raising Estella, a poor orphan, as a human weapon to break men's hearts, Ms. Havisham multiplies the pain she's experienced. Psychologist Bain observes that the production of the appearance of suffering in another person is a startling illustration of one's superior might. <coughs> Miss Havisham is a sadist as well as a masochist in Dickens' representation. Relishing Pip's fascination with Estella, the old woman urges, love her, love her. If she wounds you, love her. If she tears your heart to pieces, as it gets older and stronger, it will tear deeper. Love her, love her, love her. Pip, who shares aspects of Miss Havisham's emotional blindness, believes that Estella will marry him. The old woman feeds his illusion and tortures him by having Estella recite the names of men whose hearts she has captured. Pitt recalls that as Miss Havisham dwelt upon this role with the intensity of a mind mortally hurt and diseased, she sat with her other hand on her crutch stick and her chin <coughs> on that and her one bright eyes glaring at me, a very specter. He makes it so easy to picture her. Um, in her ugly quest to regain self-esteem, Miss Havisham causes hideous pain to others. Dickens makes it hard to sympathize with Miss Havisham, but great expectations depicts painful growth. Dickens' narrative structure enables sympathy because in realizing the nature of his own mistakes, Pip senses his affinity to his tormentor. 
married in retrospect, Pip has the opportunity to stress the difference between what he knew then and what he knows now. He uses this opportunity in emotionally charged scenes, such as when Estella turns on Miss Havisham and the old woman realizes she's wasted her life by wrecking the lives of others. Dickens follows the Spectre passage with a paragraph in which Pip repeats seven times, I saw in this. Working ironically, this passage describes what Pip did not see, and it leads to his judgment. Quote, I saw in everything the construction that my mind had come to repeated and thrown back to me. This characterization of Pip's mind applies equally well to Miss Havisham's. Through an altered Pip, Dickens offers readers images that stir sympathy for the emotionally mangled woman. At 2 a.m., Pip sees her wandering with the candle in a ghostly manner, making a low cry. When Estella announces that she'll marry brutal, abusive, Bentley Drummer, Pip observes that the spectral figure of Miss Havisham, her hands still covering her heart, seems all resolved into a ghastly stare of pity and remorse. Dickens words the passage so that it's unclear who is staring remorsefully at whom. Apparently, Miss Havisham regrets her cruelty, but the pity and remorse could refer to Pip's gaze. Fixated on his expectations with his hope of winning Estella, Pip mistreated his, kind, his kindest, most loyal friend, Joe. When Miss Havisham requests forgiveness, in writing, no less, um, he pardons her unhesitatingly. But the novel is not so kind. <coughs> Our anger is a wall of fire around us, wrote Alexander Bain. And in Dickens' hands, the angry old woman becomes a firewall. Seated close to her heart, Miss Havisham Somebody else did this, and we should get something out of it. These thoughts don't motivate him to budge from the spot, and as far as the readers know, he never does. Hem and Haas talk of injustice leads only to depression, and for a time they stand immobilized like two statues. Within the artificial system Johnson has set up, anger inhibits life-preserving motion. Johnson's attitude toward anger emerges most clearly when his frame tale resumes at the end. Corey, a doctor, agrees with the story's message. Quote, some people never change, and they pay a price for it. I see people like him in my medical practice. They feel entitled to their cheese. They feel like victims when it's taken away, and you blame others. They get sicker than people who let go and move on. Corey's status as a doctor lends authority to his view that a person who feels he has been the victim of injustice stays angry and points to an offender only makes himself sick. The character Richard responds to Corey, quote, oh, my children seem to think that nothing in their lives should ever change. They're angry. And Becky recalls her son's rage when her husband's change of job forced the teen athlete to leave his friend and enter a high school with no swim team. These references to patients and children's anger are no accident, since Johnson's book offers a doctor's or a parent's advice to a frightened, angry person, grow up. In some ways, it's sacrilegious to compare great expectations to who moved my cheese. <laughs> These critics train since the 1980s. They see all texts as equal, as exemplars of discourse and conveyors of culture. Uh, well, that's not really what I'm trying to do here. Um, I keep teaching Dickens every year, and I have not yet taught who moved my cheese. Um, as a scholar, I'm a pattern seeker, and I'm especially interested in metaphors whose appeal transcends disciplinary fields. Um, in the novel that inspires me and the self-help book that does not inspire me, um, I see a metaphorical appeal to linear forward motion. The commands let go and move on appeal to basic bodily experiences, but they combine religious, political, and economic resonances. Dickens doesn't use these terms, but he's created one of the most influential portraits of a woman paralyzed by anger. And, he's and as he constituted the portrait, as he has constituted the portrait, she lacks a legitimate reason to be angry, um, at least not for 50 years. Um, like Pitt, Miss Havisham made her own snares. Her vanity and arrogance made it easy to deceive her, and she refuses to forgive, accept her humiliation, and see her betrayal from a broader perspective, which might let her heal. She's not regulating her emotions in a way conducive to mental health. She is not managing her emotions properly. There may not even be a sheep. Back in 
the 1980s, science studies scholar Evelyn Fox Keller pointed out the deadliness of the control or be controlled outlook, which she found common among scientists, whether they were male or female. In the Anglo-American tradition, across scientific articles, popular advice books, and some fiction, a model of emotional health persists in which a self separate from the emotions is expected to manage them as a shepherd manages a flock of sheep. Well, anyone who has watched Shaun the Sheep knows how relations between sheep and farmers actually stack. William James is called to brighten the eye, works as a command to get one's flock in order. For James and the late 20th century physician Herbert uh, Spencer Johnson, Emotional management means more than maintaining one's own health. It's a matter of social responsibility. Recent scientific literature indicates increasingly how many different brain regions participate in generating and regulating emotions. In a review of neuroimaging evidence, psychologist Kevin Oxner and James Gross have found not only that numerous brain areas are involved in emotion regulation, but the different regions become involved when emotions are regulated in different ways, such as suppressing as opposed to reappraisal. It's becoming less and less realistic to imagine any self uninvolved in emotional experience that can manage emotions for personal and social good. Efforts to do so often lead to the to, to anthropomorphizing of brain regions, in which, uh, which can be very entertaining, but not very scientific. <coughs> Language itself, the English language anyway, supports a control or be controlled model by offering syntax difficult to circumvent. Um, you, you think, I control my emotions, right? Sentences like that, or Spock's famous line, I am in control of my emotions. Um, guided by language and culture, one thinks of oneself as an I who possesses, manages, and is responsible for one's emotions, which one understands as objects or as property. People in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease sometimes speak of their memories as property and of the disease as a thief who's stealing them. Any alternative would be hard to imagine, but I ask that we try to imagine it anyway. A human self that includes the emotions rather than controlling them as unruly colonial subjects and an internal life based on negotiation rather than authoritarian rule. What is at stake in representing the health of pathology of emotions? I would say the legitimacy of all human behavior and human freedom to act. Oxner and Gross begin and end their review of emotion regulation studies, not with references to classic experiments, but with references to Pandora, Adam, and Eve. Except in their opening and concluding sentences, the two scientists focus on data. But they reveal the degree to which myths and stories shape understandings of emotional experiences. With this portrayal of a woman who tries to stop time, Dickens created a powerful image of the consequences of nursing one's rage. Like the influential portrait of Alex Forrest in Fatal Attraction, Dickens' portrait of Miss Havisham emphasizes the widespread damage that one angry person can do. Within the fictional situation he's constructed, she has no legitimate grievance and is not likely to awaken much sympathy. Flesh and blood humans get angry for reasons, and embracing one's anger <coughs> may be the only comfort in situations in which one feels powerless. Anger can also motivate people to act in ways more constructive than boiling rabbits or teaching girls not to love. Sometimes the expression of, of quote-unquote negative emotions forms the first step in a fight against injustice. The woman told to brighten her eyes, straighten her posture, and speak in a major key may be unhappy because she can only find work that pays $6 an hour and she and her children are going to be evicted. Maybe she's unhappy because her part-time jobs offer no health insurance and she's just found out she has cancer. Publicly expressing her unhappiness will attract attention and create discomfort for those with good insurance and high salaries. In determining what constitutes emotional health or disease, we need to consider all the physiological, linguistic, social, religious, and economic factors that shape understandings of emotional experience. Representations of emotions rarely serve everyone's interest equally. I urge special caution towards metaphors that tie health to linear progress. Because a command for forward motion may involve steamrolling people crying for justice. Thank you.